Uh, so uh, welcome to the session called uh, Explore Spark 2.0 and Structured Streaming in Microsoft Azure HD Inside. I'm Maxim Lukyanov, uh, Program Manager on Big Data Team in, uh, in Azure. And I work primarily on our server and Spark in, uh, as part of Azure HD Inside service. So in this session, uh, we'll have fairly straightforward structure. Uh, first, we'll talk about uh, what is, uh, how we make available Spark in the cloud. Specifically, uh, we'll talk about uh, Azure HD Inside service. And then we'll uh, dive uh, straight into new features that come into Spark 2.0. And we'll cover uh, its all primary components. We'll talk about data sets, structured streams, and we'll also dive a little bit into structured streams internals to discuss how new structured streams uh, kind of deliver on its new promises. And finally, we'll have demo if Nishan fixed my machine. OK, uh, so uh, let's start with Spark. So what is Spark? Uh, Spark in the recent times uh, is a basically a new uh, hottest technology in big data space. If you are familiar with big data space, you probably know there is a, a Strata conference. It's one of the major conferences around. And I've been to Strata uh, for a couple of years, this year and the last year. So if you were at Strata last year, uh, you would realize that Spark was a big news. At that time, every session was talking about Spark, and Spark really captured the imagination, even at that kind of major event. If you were at Strata this year, you'd see that Spark is no longer news, but you would still find it in every product offered at the conference. And every talk would incorporate Spark in its, uh, in its content. There is an expo floor at Strata as well, and many startups and companies present their products. So you'd, you'd find Spark in most of those uh, booth uh, stations as well. So Spark is becoming kind of a mainstream. Uh, it's now supported by all major vendors that offer Hadoop distributions. Uh, big companies like IBM and Microsoft are making big bets on Spark. So Spark is moving into a mainstream. So that's great. Uh, it has a few things that go in for it, like a great momentum in the industry, uh, large community of uh, committers that contribute code to Spark, uh, and as well, uh, the community did a good job in uh, making sure they release new releases of Spark on a fairly good cadence. About every three months in the past year, Spark released major new feature updates. And with slight delay, now we are talking about Spark 2.0, which brings uh, new unified uh, APIs, which brings speed improvements as part of the Tungsten 2.0, uh, and new take on streaming technology called structured streams. So all those are all of the things that we are going to talk about today. So in Azure NG Insight, uh, we offer Spark. Uh, so Azure NG Insight is an uh, Azure cloud service that offers Spark as a managed service. So what do we mean by managed service? So first of all, we make it extremely easy for you to deploy clusters of machines that are configured to run Spark and uh, related Hadoop components. So in a few clicks or with a simple script, you can create a cluster fully prepared for you to run Spark. Uh, we also make these bits that we deliver to you uh, enterprise ready, So which means that we fully support them. And in order to accomplish that, we partnered with one of the major Hadoop distributors, Hortonvox, and we provide uh, full supportability guarantees. So if there is any bug or problem, either in the open source code or in the Microsoft stack. Uh, Microsoft support engineers will help you resolve those. And if you need to push bug downstream into open source uh, components, we'll do so with the help of Hortonvox. There is also high availability configuration and 24-7 uh, support uh, that are important components of the any enterprise-ready cloud service. So those are provided for you as well, so you can expect that the, cloud, uh, that the cluster in the cloud that runs Spark will be always available, and there will be always somebody who will wake up at night 
to resolve any issues if they happen. So you don't need to. At this point, I'm happy to announce that uh, later this week, we are also making, uh, uh, we are going to make available Spark 2.0 on uh, Azure region inside. Uh, at this point, uh, Spark 2.0 is a still new release. So uh, in the context of enterprise readiness, uh, we need to kind of put the distinction between uh, production ready and production ready workloads and not. So we are releasing Spark 2.0 with about 100 stability fixes uh, to make sure that you can actually start uh, applying it uh, to a production environment. On top of enterprise ready Spark in the cloud, we also provide a set of experiences as part of Azure Region Inside Service to make your data scientists and data engineers productive. And uh, that uh, implemented as part of the Azure uh, notebooks, uh, Jupyter notebooks in Azure, that this is a great in environment for data exploration, as well as uh, we provide uh, plugins for integration with integrated development environments. And you know, in case of Spark, we are talking about Scala programming language. So those plugins work with IntelliJ and Eclipse, two major kind of development platforms for Scala. And finally, uh, we also provide ODBC drivers that you can use to connect to BI tools. So Spark, one of the use cases of Spark is data warehousing. So you can easily accommodate that uh, and bring your power, connect your Power BI or Tableau or any other BI tool uh, to Spark and use it as a data warehouse. And finally, uh, last uh, kind of piece of uh, set of features that we offer on top of HD Insight Service is integration with other Azure services as well. So one of the uh, kind of major production workloads that we found our customers do is building uh, data processing pipelines. And this we help automate with a service called Azure Data Factory. So you can build Azure Data Factories that build pipelines that incorporate Spark uh, jobs. We also provide connector for Power BI and for streaming services, for Spark streaming, we provide connectors for uh, Azure service that uh, works on events <coughs> of streams called event hubs. And uh, there is also real-time uh, dashboard support in Power BI. So we provide connector for real-time dashboards in Power BI as well. Okay, so with that we can jump into Spark 2.0. Uh, and before we get started, let me clarify a couple of things. How many of you are familiar with Spark? Okay. More than a half. So we can safely dive into uh, a great kind of depths of uh, Spark 2.0. And uh, another question, are you a developer or IT pro? So who is the developer here? Also more than a half. And are you IT pro? About 20%. Okay, thank you. So uh, what, what's new in Spark 2.0? Uh, the first uh, is um, uh, new APIs that allow you to seamlessly uh, create your data pipelines. And now, as you'll see in a minute, uh, this can be both uh, batch-oriented pipelines as well as streaming pipelines. Uh, second is a major uh, improvement to the core engine of Spark that moves it towards uh, abilities of generating code and makes it more like a compiler. We'll talk about it in depth. The major uh, feature or major benefit of that feature is a great speed improvement that it gives. And finally, a new version of streaming uh, architecture that comes in Spark 2.0 called Structured Streams. There, there are also, also other smaller features in Spark 2.0 like extended support for SQL standard, uh, new machine learning algorithms that are available in R language. Uh, but we will, in this, in this session, we'll focus on core improvements to Spark 2.0 uh, that take it to a next level in terms of its architecture. So let's start uh, with data sets. So in order to uh, kind of talk about data sets, we need to start with the core of the Spark, with, with its resilient distributed data sets, and understand 
but was limiting in that technology. Success of Spark so far was driven forward in large part because the level of abstraction and implementation of the RDDs was so great. So what is, what is lacking in, in, in them? So what is RDD? The RDD is, is an object, core object in Spark that represents three pieces of information. First, it has a notion of partition, and that allows it to distribute data set across multiple machines. That includes notion of data locality, which allows Spark uh, to run computation on the same machine where data resides. Second is a notion of lineage. Each RDD has a notion of an input of data, which is another RDD. And it's, at any time, it can ask, recompute its state by asking this parent RDD to give this input data again. That forms a core of the computational graph that Spark basically executes. And finally, the most important piece of the RDD is a computation that it encapsulates. And in RDD, this, uh, this abstraction is very generic. It says, hey, it can be any Java function that returns, that processes input data and outputs the output data. And that is a very generic abstraction that ties Spark to Java. Basically, the, this contract says that you can operate on any data structure that Java supports, and you can execute any operation that Java supports. Basically, that implies that while you're executing these computations, you'd have to rely on the Java runtime to perform data, uh, data manipulations and actually execute arbitrary Java code. So these computations and data structures are invisible to the Spark as a data processing engine. They're opaque to Spark. And that's a major limitation of this, the abstraction is that, that is too generic that prevents Spark from taking um, more, uh, from making more optimizations to the computations that it performs on data. And that's the problem that data sets and data frames are solving in the new Spark 2.0. So what is data set? Data set accomplishes three things. First, uh, it uh, brings the knowledge of the data structures. And that implies that it brings also limitations on what kind of data structures you can have. So the data structures that data sets and data frames operate on are transparent to Spark. And second, it brings structure and transparency to computations as well. So you, at this point, if, you're, if you were familiar with Spark 1.6, you can say, hey, but this is the data frames from 1.6. The transparent computation and data were available as part of the data frames already. And you would be right. And in that sense, data set is the same thing as a data frame, uh, but it brings one third additional feature, which is type safety. And this is where it moves the kind of uh, equation forward. Uh, data set also allows you, in addition to transparent computation and data, it allows you to express your uh, computations in operations in a type-safe manner. And you, you can see here an example of this type-safe computations. Uh, you can basically use Spark to read some arbitrary JSON file, uh, rely on its ability to infer the schema of this data, and then tell Spark to treat this content of data as a class person, that's a Scala language if you're not familiar with that. And then you can express computations or this data using type safe operations. So you can, in this example, we'll do group by and we'll do some histogram computation uh, on this uh, person object. The benefit of that approach of type safety is that you get compi compile time errors. And this slide summarizes what type of structured computations you can now perform in Spark 2.0. Uh, you can do just a SQL query language that's still supported. Uh, you can use data frame APIs, and you can use new data set APIs. And the differences between them are well described by the, by the moment when you get an error. If you write a SQL, it will be just a script, and you, all of the errors will be at runtime when you actually try to run the script. If you write uh, your computation, you, if you express your computations in the form of data frames, then 
you would get compile time errors if you perform incorrect operations. But if you misspell the field name, then you'll get this error only at runtime. And finally, with data sets, you'll get all of the errors, even if you just misspelled the field name or table name uh, at compile time. And that increases your productivity and also enables one important factor. It enables a powerful um, code manipulation techniques like refactoring. So now you can safely apply refactoring to your code uh, and, and, and know that all of the field names will not escape code refactoring tools. In Spark 2.0, this data frame and data set APIs are brought together. And data frame basically is, is just an alias that says, oh, I am just a data set uh, that operates on an untyped row, class, class row. Uh, these two data frame APIs and data set APIs are connected with each other. So you can treat the data set of typed objects uh, as, a, as a data frame and operate and apply all of the operations available in data frame to data sets. And vice versa, you, at, at any moment in time, for any data frame, you can say, hey, I want to treat it as a, uh, as a data set and I, I want to infor, enforce some specific schema of, of a specific class on this uh, data frame. And that is uh, accomplished by uh, as operator. So you can specify how you want to treat data in this class. All of these um, endpoints, the SQL, data frame, and data set, uh, now uh, have structure. And uh, Spark can now take them and apply all of the optimizations uh, to the structured computation and data. And uh, this is available through Catalyst as a, a query optimization um, component in Spark, and all three share the same uh, optimization engine. So as the first step of this query optimization, uh, all three types of queries will be transformed in their single representation of logical query plan. Then it will be optimized by applying uh, operations such as predicate push down into optimized logical plan. And as a next step of optimization, there will be uh, physical optimization applied, which will uh, apply operations such as choosing what type of join to apply to the, uh, to the data sets based on their sites and things like that. And finally, in the end, you'll get a good old graph of RDDs that actually re represent a physical uh, computational plan for Spark. Here is an example of a logical query plan that is generated for, for this uh, query expressed in a data frame. The interesting part here is this filter that is expressed using uh, data frame uh, expressions. You can see that we are trying to filter this data set uh, on the age field, and there is some predicate on that. Uh, so in a logical plan, you can see that Spark was able to understand that computation uh, and express it in a logical plan, not as some uh, arbitrary function, but it actually able to say that, hey, I see that there is a predicate on an age field. And that is important because now Spark can arbitrarily optimize this uh, computation and express it in a way that is most optimal uh, uh, for a given situation. For example, uh, if you were uh, to use just an RDD APIs in the past, then this predicate on a field uh, would look like an anonymous function to Spark. And it wouldn't be able to uh, convert it into anything else. These expressions that we just used, Spark is able to understand the meaning, the semantics of that computation, and as you can see in the next steps, would uh, implement it differently depending on the context. There are many expressions that Catalyst support to allow uh, us as the developers uh, to uh, specify a variety of predicates uh, in, a, in a way that is transparent to the Spark as a, as a data engine. So you can uh, use string manipulation functions, um, mathematical functions, and the rest of the functions in your data frame and data set API calls. So one of the optimizations that now Spark is able to perform 
based on this transparent uh, structured computations is predicate push down. And in this example, uh, we are talking about scenario where you are using Spark as a federated query engine on top of uh, some external data source. For example, SQL Server. So if you express this query, you would uh, ask Spark to connect to a SQL Server and retrieve some data and apply this predicate on edge. So now that the predicate is transparent, Spark will actually, as part of its query optimization process, will push down this predicate down into a SQL Server. And for this federated scenario, if you're familiar with SQL Server, that may have a dramatic impact on performance. And that what uh, these new techniques kind of enable uh, for Spark. They enable new scenarios where Spark can start uh, operating more intelligently on external data uh, and uh, perform much more optimized, make much more optimized decisions. Yeah, go ahead. That's a great question. The question is, uh, what, how far this uh, uh, predicate pushdown uh, goes? Like, what are the capabilities of predicate pushdown? Uh, right now, uh, in theory, these capabilities can be pretty extensive. But right now, they're limited by the contract that is uh, set on the data source APIs in Spark. And right now, they work only on the conjunction uh, of simple uh, predicates. So it will push down any ends and, uh, um, and actual predicates, but it will not be able to push down any or or any, any more complex expressions like that. Okay. Um, so um, you talked about transparent and structured computations. The next part of that is um, structured data model. So in a Spark 2.0, uh, we have a final realization of tungsten project where all of this uh, work come to fruition. And uh, Spark now takes over the manage memory management from Java VM and manages all of the data that it processes by itself by using just a, a flat memory arrays that it allocates uh, from uh, outside of the Java, Java heap. And uh, at the 2.0 uh, version it supports uh, quite a rich data structures. It supports all of the primitive types. It allows you to have arrays as a column type, uh, as well as structs and dictionaries. So if your data structure is more complex than that, uh, Stark would have to fall back into a regular kind of Java, uh, Java object allocation. But if your data structures fit within these boundaries, then all of the optimizations that we're talking about would apply. For example, so what does, it, what does it look like? So it has a, a significant, uh, it makes a significant difference of how you handle objects. For example, if you allocate Java string, then it's well known that there is a 48 bytes uh, overhead that you'd pay uh, for each string that you allocate. And with the new direct memory operation, Spark kind of eliminates that overhead as well as many other benefits that it provides. Uh, this example uh, shows kind of binary row encoding is used in Spark. So if you have a row that can consist of the three values, one is integer and a couple of strings, uh, in the data structures that Spark allocate, it will allocate this binary object that looks like that. So you can see that it uses uh, direct memory offsets to specify where string resides, uh, and it uses direct in-memory placement for integers. So there is no um, uh, overhead involved in terms of allocating separate object for, for every column. Uh, all of the data is placed uh, as a single, uh, in a single byte array. Uh, in 2.0, so what you saw just now is uh, the row-based uh, representation of data. In 2.0, Spark also introduces uh, a columnar uh, binary representation of data where instead of uh, grouping data by a row, it actually groups data by a column. And that improves 
uh, cache locality and efficiency of uh, aggregation operations significantly uh, due to the CPU architecture and how cache in CPU works. Uh, one of the benefits of that direct memory uh, allocation is just the space efficiency. So with data sets and direct memory representation, uh, you just get, uh, remove all of the Java overhead and you're talking about significantly less amount of memory that is needed to represent your data set in memory. And another benefit that is very important is uh, reduction in terms of uh, data serialization, deserialization. In fact, now that Spark operates with these binary data structures, uh, if it needs to send this data set to some other machine for shuffling, uh, it actually doesn't need to perform any data serialization. You can just send these bytes over the network and uh, start operating over, the, over this data on another machine directly. So that leads to a dramatic improvement in terms of serialization deserialization performance. The next uh, phase of, um, of optimization is actually putting together these two, two aspects, uh, transparent computation and transparent data. So once you have information about those two, you can do the ultimate optimization where you can say, hey, I can just generate the code that is exactly doing what computation asks to do and operates on a data structures that are optimized to what is asked to do. So you can basically transform your data framework into a compiler that generates as efficient code as possible. And uh, you might hear about Spark 2.0 phrases like, hey, Spark 2.0 brings computation uh, to a bare metal. So that's what it means. Spark now is able to generate code uh, that tries to squeeze out as much as possible from your hardware at the lowest level uh, available. For example, if you're talking about a simple query that counts a number of rows with applying of some filter, as a result of this code generation, Spark will generate code that doesn't have any Virtual, uh, virtual function invocations. It has just a simple loop that you would write in C uh, and it uh, accesses data directly using local variables. So that would be the most efficient that uh, it can be uh, from, the, from the programming point of view. For example, uh, kind of more detailed example here, if, you're, uh, if, you, uh, if you recall our predicate with age, then uh, as a catalyst expression, it would be expressed as, an, as a transparent object for Spark. And at the code generation moment, Spark will actually use direct memory access to read the value from the particular offset in memory, then apply a specific, specified predicate in place and return results back. Uh, additional benefit comes here from the Java platform support for this so-called unsafe memory operations, where you can express this operation of retrieving a value from a particular offset, and Java will, uh, at JIT time, will actually translate this operation into uh, direct memory offset operations. So this uh, translates into a significant speed up for the queries that involve lots of computations and lots of uh, memory operations. So now with Spark 2.0, you'll rarely see garbage collection overhead or problems with garbage collection. And uh, in terms of TPCDS results, uh, we, we can see uh, speed up from 3x to 10x. So that's very good. So any questions so far? Okay, so let's talk about structured streams. So uh, existing Spark streaming APIs existed for quite some time, uh, and uh, they're quite good in terms of throughput. They allow you to build a pipeline that produces exactly one semantics of event processing, but there is no way to guarantee that your streaming pipeline does it. Uh, you can build a fault-tolerant pipeline as well. Uh, 
but there is also a set of limitations. And first, a uh, significant limitation is that uh, there is no uh, notion of the event time in Spark in current in these streams APIs, and that makes it uh, nearly impossible to express very common operation where you want to uh, ensure that the event that arrived late will actually be processed with the other events uh, that belong to it based on its event time. Uh, there is a lack of interoperability between your streaming pipelines and the batch operations in Spark. Basically, it's very hard to query uh, results of the streaming pipeline and bring it uh, inside of some web application. Uh, and while exactly one semantic processing is possible, uh, it's actually your responsibility as a developer in these streamless APIs to make sure that you use correct components and you configure the system correctly uh, that you never lose events and you always calculate, uh, produce correct results. And finally, uh, kind of uh, fault to tolerance and uh, high availability in these streams are based on the checkpointing mechanism. And in some cases, uh, it's actually very inefficient as it doesn't have ability to, uh, to say to do the checkpoint uh, with a partial state update. It always needs to kind of uh, uh, save the full result of your uh, streaming processing. So all of those limitations are targeted to be fixed in a new structured streaming. And structured streaming is a complete rewrite, basically, of the streaming from the past. It's a completely new implementation of streaming engine. It is nicely integrated with data frames. So now we are talking about the single APIs that you can use to run your batch queries as well as streaming queries. So there is no difference. You just treat um, the data set that you're operating on as an ever-increasing infinite data set if you're operating over the streaming data. But from, from uh, that point of uh, view, there is no difference from the actual queries that you're writing, whether you're writing batch or streaming. At the high level, um, structured streaming offers new APIs that uh, kind of take much more responsibility for you than uh, it was in the past. So now structured streaming uh, provides much more guarantees. It, uh, it always pr provides guarantee of exactly one semantic, uh, exactly one processing semantic of event processing. So that means that uh, regardless of how you write your streaming pipeline now, you will always get this guarantee, which is uh, basically a, uh, an, an almost always the case that you would want to have those semantics. And finally, there is uh, many improvements in terms of how you actually operate with your streaming pipelines. Uh, you can integrate it with batch mode. Uh, you can manage queries in a much more uh, convenient manner than before. Uh, and uh, there is an integration with ML models that is coming as well. So let's take a look at how new streaming uh, APIs look like. Uh, first, we'll start with a batch query, and in this query, we would read some JSON file, uh, apply the query, and uh, produce the results, and save results in some place. Uh, with new uh, streaming APIs, it's very easy now to convert this query into a streaming query. You just change the input and output, and the query itself actually remains the same, because the APIs are the same. So you, re uh, you change the read statement to read stream statement, and you define what is the source of your uh, streaming. And when you're writing, you're uh, specifying what is the output of your writing, but the query remains the same. In terms of logical model of uh, streaming execution, new streaming still uh, remains uh, kind of a micro-batch model. So it still retains this uh, micro-batch ar architecture. And the first, uh, uh, the input data is now treated as an ever-increasing uh, append-only table. And uh, uh, Spark Streaming detects the mo mo moments, triggers, when the new data is, has arrived. So once the new data arrived, it uh, starts a new uh, query processing. So it, takes this mic it generates this micro-batch and sends it to, to process the query. And after the query produces the results, it sends it to, to the output. There are um, three uh, modes of output. The simplest one is a complete output, where all of the results of the 
query processing will be sent to the output every time the micro batch is processed. But you also can uh, do up and only mode where only new rows that were generated during query processing will be sent to output and the delta mode where, it, where only changes will be sent, sent out. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the question is, uh, what would be the example where this can be used in business? Uh, well, in, during demo, we'll have a couple of examples. I think that would help. Uh, but to briefly answer your question, uh, it actually depends on the query, what kind of output you would want. So some queries actually don't, uh, wouldn't make sense without complete output. For example, if you're counting all of the rows in the stream, the output will always be a complete output with just a single number. But for some uh, queries that process kind of deltas of the data, you'd uh, use append only or delta mode. But in the demo, we'll, uh, we'll get to it in more detail. So here's an example of the ever kind of uh, ever increasing count, or actually average in this case. So uh, you, would, you can say that on a stream, I want to count average of a query time. And um, for the for the times that the query is run, it will always calculate this average. Uh, and the output of this query, regardless of how large your input is, will always be a single number, the average at this point in time. You can also express a group by query, where you can group by a specific column and uh, do averages within each group. And you can also now, a uh, new feature in Spark 2.0, uh, you can apply a window function to your groups and calculate uh, averages or any other aggregates for each window uh, in, this, uh, in this group. Nice part about this new uh, window function is that it's also available uh, for, for batch queries as well. So you can uh, rerun your query over the static data and produce the same result. Uh, and uh, now that we have optima, uh, unified, optima, uh, sorry, unified APIs between batch and streaming processing, uh, the more advanced operations like joins become possible. So in this example, you can see how you can implement a very common operation in streaming where you have a reference data set. And as part of your streaming process, you need to look up some data from this reference data set. So now we can express this operation as a join and join static data set into your uh, streaming pipeline. And every time the micro batch is executed, you would get the, uh, the joint results to produce some output. In fact, yeah. Good. Uh, the question is, uh, is there a different type of windows? So that's a great question. So if you go back here, so this, this is a hopping window. So it basically represents uh, a slice of time where the values will be calculated. Uh, Spark also supports a sliding window where you can have a second parameter which should overlap where the two windows would overlap. You, you can also call it tumbling window depending on how you call it. Uh, okay, so in terms of query processing, in the past, uh, when you deal with streaming pipelines, you had to create streaming context. And they were very hard to manage. So for every streaming process, you had to have your separate streaming context. Now Spark kind of gains the knowledge about all the streaming pipelines that you have within the single uh, Spark context. So you can create as many queries, streaming queries as you like, and they all will be visible as part of your Spark uh, context. And then uh, when you actually create the start streaming process, you get an object, query object, that you can use to manage those queries. You can stop them, uh, check their status, see what exception they generated, and things like, things like that. Any questions so far? Yeah. Is there any way to limit the queries to only to a data that you haven't seen before? Yeah, so that, that's uh, 
we'll actually get into this in this section. But that's exactly the new promise that structured streaming gives you. It actually gives you exactly one processing semantics. So you always get this guarantee. And we'll see how this is actually implemented. Okay, so um, a little bit about how all of these promises uh, are guaranteed by Spark. So first of all, uh, given that uh, APIs, again, are unified, uh, regardless of uh, whether you specify a streaming uh, pipeline or streaming query or batch query, you always get a data frame. But they will be of different types. And only at the moment when you actually execute this data frame, uh, Spark Catalyst Optimizer will generate different execution plans. And in case of streaming query, it will generate what's called inter in incremental execution plan. So it will create an object called planner that will be always resident in memory and it will manage uh, lifetime of your query. So it will generate incremental physical plans every time it will detect that the new data is uh, available. And then it will go through the Spark processing pipeline to execute this new incremental physical plan. The planner, uh, that's an object that is now central to the uh, streaming query, uh, will periodically poll the sources of your data and check for the availability of the new data. And then it will uh, schedule the new incremental execution plan and will generate it, and it will, that one will generate the output. In this example, let's say we have a very simple uh, query that counts uh, rows. So in the first time, planner will detect that there is uh, offsets of data available from 90 to 100. It will schedule an execution, and the result of that execution will be a count of 100, assuming that there were 100 rows. The next time the planner uh, uh, checks uh, uh, the source of the data, it may detect that the new set of data is, are, is available from the offsets of 100 to 110. And it will then generate new execution plan, and the execution plan will generate a new count that, hey, now it's 110 items counted. So what's important here is that during these aggregations, uh, the incremental execution uh, one needs, uh, needs to pass information about its current count to the incremental execution two. So there is a notion of the state that you need to preserve during these uh, streaming calculations. And Spark now has a first class new object called state store that stores the state. So once the uh, incremental execution one finishes its calculation, it will store the current count, which is 100 at this point, into the state store. And the next time planner schedules execution two, execution two will read the state store, will read the value of 100, and will continue with its calculations. And after it finishes the calculations, it will up update the current state store. Yes, question. Uh, the question is, what happens when the uh, fault happens? Uh, and you're uh, talking about exactly about the next slide that we are going to. Perfect. So what happens uh, during, uh, during faults? So that is the most important question in the, uh, in the streaming processing. How you recover faults and how you keep yourself uh, efficient and fast uh, in the, in the, in, while doing so. So in order to achieve fault tolerance and uh, preserve exactly one's processing semantic guarantees that Spark Structured Streaming now has. You have to ensure that uh, recovery of all of the components uh, that you have in your system uh, kind of falls, first is possible, and second, uh, guarantees this uh, uh, exactly one's processing semantics. So how is this accomplished? So let's review uh, component by component. So first, uh, planner, that is a central system for uh, for any uh, streaming query, maintains its state in a write-ahead log. So every time planner makes a decision about uh, scheduling new incremental execution, it writes these uh, decisions into a write-ahead log. And if planner fails at any moment in time, it aborts or marks all of the in-flight executions as failed, and it will go back to the last one that it knows successfully succeeded, and will schedule 
retry of all of the operations after that. And that retry of all operations after that has implications for rest of the components in the system. First, it has implication on the sources. So if at any moment in time, planner can say that, hey, uh, stop this particular execution, I deem it incorrect, uh, you need to be able to restart this execution. And that means that you need to be able to read this, the same data set from the source. So the sources are now have a, a guarantee on them, or have to provide a guarantee that they are replayable. And, those, and this is a kind of a, a simple requirement for modern sources in the streaming pipelines, like both Kafka and Event Hub provide this guarantee as part of their core design. <coughs> Sorry. But th and that's uh, kind of a first requirement on the sources that uh, feed into this uh, guarantees that structured streaming provides. The second is a state store. So that's a critical component of new system. So whenever you need to restart execution, uh, you may find yourself in a situation where some of the state updates have already happened, and now you need to roll them back. So that uh, basically transforms your, transforms your state store in a transactional NoSQL database, no less than that. So at the moment of a failure, planner would actually need to instruct state store to reconstruct its state to some point in uh, to some point back in time and reject all of the uh, updates that were not complete. That's a very strong guarantee, and that's actually, jumping a little bit ahead, is the reason why uh, structured streaming in its current implementation in Spark 2.0 uh, is uh, marked as an alpha release. Because the current implementation for state store is actually fairly simplistic, uh, and it uh, has some difficulties with scaling and uh, that's, that's the primary reason that leads to kind of an alpha uh, state of the structured streaming feature as a whole. So the next uh, component is syncs. And uh, in case of failure, what you can encounter is that uh, you would need to uh, send the output of your computation again to your, out, uh, to your sync, to the output of your data. Uh, and uh, the only way to actually make sure that this doesn't lead uh, to a corruption of data or to incorrect uh, calculation is to require the, uh, the, so the sync of your data to be idempotent, which means that it should be possible to write the same results into your output without double counting or without producing incorrect results. So that's a set of guarantees that kind of drive end-to-end uh, -end, uh, exactly one's process in semantics. Uh, basically, in structured streaming, Spark achieves that uh, by, requiring, by making these re requirements on the components of the system and by implementing, uh, by carefully implementing uh, fault recovery in its own core engine. Okay, so let's see if our demo works still. Any questions so far? Give me a second. That should be seven. Okay, let's see. Oh, sorry. Okay, so let me switch back. Uh, you'll need to recover the demo. Uh, the doesn't look like keyboard is working on my machine. Let's uh, give it a minute to try, and we'll see how it goes. Okay, now it's working. So let's switch back now here. Uh, yeah, keyboard is working, so we should be good. Uh, let's increase uh, font size so you can see it. 
Okay, yeah, that's great. So on this cluster, I have um, Spark installed. So let's uh, launch Spark shell. So you can see it. Okay, that's great. And let's open second window as well because we will need to simulate some uh, streaming operations. So let's make sure we have two windows to do that. Let's increase font size of this one as well. Okay, let's resize it. Okay, perfect. So on the right window, we'll create a simple uh, uh, socket server that will just uh, output on its HTTP uh, socket the characters that we'll type on the keyboard. So that's the right, right window. And on the left window, we have uh, Spark 2.0 shell. Uh, and uh, let's use some scripts that I prepared to run. So first of all, uh, we will create some uh, streaming queries. And in this example, uh, we'll use, the as a source of our data, we'll use this uh, HTTP server again. So the first one would be, hey, how do we specify the streaming operation? So Spark uh, Structured Streaming today comes with a few uh, built-in sources. So one of the built-in sources is a socket, is a format socket, has a format socket. So that allows you to connect to arbitrary HTTP socket and start reading this data and treat it as a, a stream of events. So let's create that one and we'll call it lines. As you can see, uh, when we created it, it uh, produced the data frame, but uh, nothing else happened. So that's uh, kind of a natural uh, property of the data frames that now applies to streaming operations. So when you specify your query, you're just building this data frame object, uh, but no calculations are happening at this time. So you need to start the query uh, in order to actually start processing. So let's continue building our query so we get our input characters, and now we'll do some word count. So we'll convert our data frame into a data set by treating the, each row as just a string, and then we'll apply our custom code using flat map operation to split the string into words using space as a delimiter. So let's do that. And again, we'll get a new data, data frame or data set now uh, that uh, still doesn't produce any computations. So further, we'll apply um, a group by operation, and uh, we are building a streaming pipeline, but you can see here we are using just a regular data frame APIs to do that. So we'll group by each word, and we'll calculate the count of those words. Again, we get new data frame. And finally, we can start the actual calculation by using the write stream operation and uh, starting it. The important pieces here are output mode, which we will use complete, which means that every time the micro batch is executed, we'll see the complete results of the query processing. And uh, again, there is a few built-in syncs in structured streaming. Uh, and the one that's very useful for debugging is a console sync, which will just print the full uh, output of, of your streaming query to the console every time batch query is executed. So now let's start the query processing. And you can see that uh, the result of this operation is a query object, streaming query. And now it's, it's active. So let's try to type some characters. So let's say A, B, C, and a couple more uh, repeats. So you can see that a batch, new batch was formed and it's been processed, and the full output is printed to the console. So it we detected that there is ABC in our input, and the A was repeated three times. So let's try it once more. 
And you can see that, uh, again, new batch is generated, uh, and uh, it generates output. So um, let's do some query management. So this uh, query is running in the background. So we can explore what we have in Spark. So I believe it's active. Oh, streams, yeah. So uh, now the Spark um, context, which is now called in Spark 2.0 called Spark Session, has a streams uh, collection that uh, has collection of all of the streams that uh, Spark context is managing. So we can say streams active, and then we can say for each and print them. So now we can see that in the active there is an active stream that is called streaming query, query zero. So now we can see all of the queries that we have created uh, inside of our uh, Spark session. And one of the operations that we can do is to simply stop our query from executing. So now if we type more characters here, uh, we wouldn't see any processing happening. So that's very convenient. The next uh, step uh, is a very nice feature in Spark Structured Streaming, which uh, allows you to very easily run batch queries over the results of your streaming process. And that's accommodated through another built-in format, which is in-memory table. So you can convert those results of streaming process in just a table, in the Spark table, that you can later on use in your batch queries. So let's do that. So in this case, we will use our word count, we will sort them by value, and we will output again complete uh, result into an in-memory table called counts. So let's do that. So now uh, another streaming query is running in the background. And let's feed it some data, again, ABC. And uh, let's use Ricky and ABC. And you'll see in a minute why I'm, I used Ricky. And uh, now we, we can query this table, because now we have table counts. So let's see. Yep. So it has all of the values that uh, our streaming calculation computed so far. Uh, this is a great example of how you can build a very powerful web applications or some uh, representation logic that represents the current real-time state of your system, like imagine uh, dashboards that show current uh, count of alerts or uh, dashboards that represent kind of latest processed events. All of that becomes very simple uh, now with this in-memory tables that Spark provides. Uh, and the final example, uh, let's uh, do the join with the reference data set. So I have a very simple uh, three-line JSON file. So let's show its content. So it has just a age and name column. And we'll use name column for a join. So we'll join it with our uh, query processing. And uh, the join will, uh, will be expressed using data frame APIs. So we'll say, hey, word counts, which is our streaming query, uh, join with the people, which is our static uh, data set, using uh, values and name as a join condition and the join will be left outer, so we don't lose data in our streaming context if there is no corresponding key in the static data set. Then we'll do some uh, uh, shaping of the data, and we'll write it again into console so we can see the results. Okay, so now it's running. Uh, query 2 was created. And if we put some more rikis here and some more ABCs, we'll see that new batch is being processed, and the result of the output is for ABCs, there is no age column, but for Ricky that is present in our static data set, we success successfully joined the age into our streaming computation. Okay, 
Uh, so we did, uh, we did that already. And another variant of actually uh, joining the tables is, using, is joining with in-memory table. So not only as part of the streaming calculation, you can uh, join uh, data with a streaming data set. But our in-memory table that is still running in the background, you can join with it as well. And in the, another uh, example here you can see is that you can use SQL to operate with data from your streaming queries. So it's all interoperable. You can use data frame, data set, or SQL syntax to work with your streaming or batch data uh, in all combinations. So if you look back, you can see that our in-memory table calcul uh, ac uh, accum accumulated two rekeys and it successfully joined, this, uh, joined its edge from the static data set. Okay, so that concludes our demo. We can switch back uh, to the session. So any questions so far? Okay, so in terms of roadmap, I already mentioned that structured streaming is currently in the alpha state. Uh, it has some missing features, like there is no even sync for Kafka or for Event Hub, for example. There is only sync for, for this built-in kind of HTTP server. So uh, in addition to missing features, there is also some uh, scalability improvements that needs to happen. So in the Spark 2.1, uh, we expect to reach the point where we'll be able to actually use structured streaming pipelines in production. But uh, regardless, uh, structured streaming still represents a significant step forward to Spark from the architectural point of view. And once all of the components fall into place, it will make it extremely, uh, or let's say, much easier uh, to build a reliable and robust streaming pipelines. Uh, here's a documentation uh, that captures kind of a first steps of structured streaming, you can use that one. Uh, and in terms of sessions, uh, if you're interested in a more information about Spark, tomorrow we have session about uh, doing interactive analysis with Spark using all of the other features that I mentioned uh, available to you as part of HD Insight, like notebooks, uh, plugins for ID, all things like that. So we'll explore, explore that part. Uh, we'll also talk tomorrow again uh, how you can use our server on top of Spark. So if you're our person, our server gives great kind of features for you for machine, for scalable machine learning. And now uh, in the new version of our server, it's actually running on top of Spark. It uses Spark as its distributed compute engine. So we'll talk about that. And uh, if you're interested in just overview of all of the big data services that we have in Azure, we had a session uh, about that uh, called the idea of it is 3248. So you can look, up, look it up and uh, watch a recording of that. Uh, and uh, there is also additional resources for you available and even more resources for you available. Uh, and please let us know uh, how we can improve the session. Please submit your evaluations.